Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And today we're going to be talking about my top 10 underrated board games. So these are hidden gems. This criteria for this list is all of these games are rated below the 1000 mark on the BGG listings, the Board Game Geek listing. Uh, so these are games that are just not in enough people's hands. These are the hidden gems that I think everybody should be playing. They should be hitting your table. They should be talked about constantly. These games are absolutely wonderful and you need to know about them. I think that these are games that if you watch this channel a lot, you may know some of them, but these are some favorites here in the side game library, some guaranteed hits and ones that we really enjoy. So without further ado, let's jump into the list. Now, before we start, I do have one honorable mention, and this is the game Game to Pick a Game. Now, the reason it's not really on the list here is we don't really use it as like a a game per se, but it's more of a tool. This is a game that you literally use to pick other games. You guys can't decide what you're doing on game night. Everybody can't really, you know, figure out something. You write a nomination on here, you put it in the center, and everybody's going to be using these chips to bid on the one they actually want to play. It's a cool way that if you're really having trouble deciding something, you have a concrete way to do it, and it just gets a conversation started. So very interesting conversation piece, interesting tool, not the greatest game in the world, but for what it's trying to do, I think that this is such a cool concept, and I think that this one needs to be known about. It's by Chip Theory Games, so amazing production, great quality, and a great idea. I really like this one. That's my honorable mention. That's going to be game to pick a game. But let's jump into the list with number 10, Balderdash. Now, Balderdash is a party game where you and a bunch of other players are going to be writing your pretend definitions or guesses to these weird, quirky ideas. So for example, your card might say something like a weird word, and you're going to have to do your best to make a believable definition for this weird word. So, oh, what is a uh, tweezuk? Oh, oh, tweezuk. Oh, clearly it's a infection of uh, such and such. And you're going to put your answer in with everybody else's answers, but also the person who's reading the card knows and writes the real answer. It's your job to discern which one is the correct answer while hopefully fooling everybody else. Now, this game is so fantastic because the creativity comes from the players. They are able to talk and laugh and really do their best to try to sound like they know what they're talking about. And this leads to some hilarious things. So, oh man, this game just leads to a lot of laughs, a lot of fun. Fantastic game. That is Balderdash. My number nine goes to the game Sorcerer. And this is one that I'm really quite surprised on. I really like this game. It is a kind of a classic um, mage versus mage style game, except in this one, instead of just beating up each other, you're trying to control these locations, which you also see in similar games. So it borrows a lot of mechanics from other games, but ultimately you're going to be crafting this deck of using two different kind of schools of magic, a character, and then a creature type. You'll mix all those things together, and then you'll take them out into the battlefield and do your best to control these areas. But my favorite thing in this game has to be the way that the game is structured. The game rounds are very back and forth. It's really cool. So you'll have your first player token. That person determines the amount of energy everybody's getting. So if they are, uh, if they want to get a set amount or maybe a randomized amount, it's it's really cool how they have some manipulation here. If the board state is advantageous to, this, advantageous to them, they can increase the amount of kind of resources you're getting. Um, other than that, they they can kind of cap it as well. And I think that's so neat. But the round system is really cool. I like the back and forth. I love that after the action phase, you have a battle phase that you know is happening, what you're prepping for. And ultimately, you're trying to dominate these locations and hopefully win the game. I really like the system of crafting the cards. It's just one that I really enjoy. And I was quite surprised that it has this theme that doesn't really stand out. But the gameplay is fun. I was, I'm very pleased with this one. It's a great at two players. And I'm very excited for when the cooperative stuff drops. But I think that in this crowded genre, I think Sorcerer really is one that really sticks with you. It does a lot of clever things with its mechanics, and I think it's one that's worth checking out. That's Sorcerer, my number nine. My number eight goes to the game Unbroken. Now, this is a solo-only game, but it does a fantastic job of doing this. It has you setting out on an adventure, and in this adventure, you're going to have a character with stats, special skills, abilities, and then a weapon that you can upgrade as you play. You'll also have kind of a trove of resources, so things like meat and steel, treasure, and your life force, which is your stamina, and that's these like fist icons. And as you play, you're going to be using those 
those fists and trading in resources to do all sorts of things to eventually go after a bunch of monsters. And these monsters are all unique and different. The way the combat system is done is really straightforward. You go back and forth fighting from monster to monster. They'll have this six-sided die that's just going to determine the way that they react. So the AI is very easy, but the biggest part and the thing that I find the most fun has to be just the system of trading and exploring. A lot of the times you're going to see these cards and they offer you conditions. You can either take the trade by paying the cost and time or you can um, ignore the card completely and take the cost and time as hit points essentially. And I think that's really cool. I love that every card presents you with options and I think that's so interesting. And you reveal two cards at a time so you even have more options on top of that. It is so neat. I love this system. It's one that you can sit there and just have a fun time evaluating cards as they come up, which is something I really enjoy in games. So I really enjoy this one. It's kind of been marred by its production company. Uh, that's why it's very low rated. It's just because a lot of people didn't even get the game and were very soured on the whole experience with the backing of it. But if you can get a copy of this game, it's a blast. It's a great soul experience. It does exactly what it sets out to be, to be this uh, individualized dungeon crawl with a very challenging gameplay, but a lot of fun, great decisions. That's my number eight, Unbroken. My number seven goes to the game Tifa Tashin. Now, Tifa Tashin is so fun. It's got a great theme. You're all a bunch of corrupt politicians. Your whole goal is to make money by either being the president and stuffing your pockets full of it, or by using the influence that you've attained by teaming up with said president and gaining as much money from them as possible. Now, the game is played with this action system where everybody is taking a card from their hand, putting it down, and then in turn order from the president, you reveal it, and then you resolve what it does. You have cards where you can vote to kick the president out of power, you can vote to keep him in and you know vote yes on this bill of money he's passing, or you can completely ignore what's going on with the way that the president's passing out money, and you can decide to mess with the other players at the table. You can blackmail them. You can anti-blackmail if you think that they're going to try to steal from you, or you can just ignore all of this and just try to be the first one to grab money off the top of the deck. The game is quick, the game is funny, and the game has a lot of table talk and negotiation. I love this theme. I love the way that this is just... It's, it's politics, and it cracks me up. I think that the art is hilarious. I love the voting system. I love how simple and straightforward it is. Uh, there is a re-themed version of this game, if you'd like. It's called um, Good Critters, and it has a kind of a, a mafia theme with uh, bunnies and you know animals. But I really like this version of the game. It deep pockets, right? And I think that you know comes out in spades in this game. So one I really enjoy, that's my number seven, Tifa Tashin. Now, my number six goes to the game Raise Your Goblets. Now, Raise Your Goblets is a game where you play as a family that sends out one of your offspring to this gathering of families every year with the intent on killing each other, and everybody knows it. So you're going to send out these people. You're going to be poisoning drinks, just like in Princess Bride, and your goal is to eliminate your target while staying alive yourself. You have some cool player powers that are going to manipulate the things that you can do, but ultimately, your goal poison those cups and get everybody to drink it. This is such a straightforward, fun game. It does have a bit of a memory aspect, but I think the more you play, the more you understand that this game is about the fun, the experience, the challenge, and just the bombastic fun plays that can happen from this. This is a fantastic game. That is Razor Goblets, my number six. Oh, my favorite part in this game has to be just the cups themselves. I think that is such a cool concept. I love how simple the actions are. You're able to look at them, manipulate them, and I love the way that different characters interact with the cups. Some remove the base, so it's harder to memorize things. Some allow you to switch or rotate multiple times. Uh, some allow you to put cards on top of the cup to prevent people from putting things in that. I love this concept. I think it's such a fantastic game. That is Razor Goblets, my number six. Now, my number five goes to Cloud Age. Now, Cloud Age here is a Alexander Fister design, one of my favorites. And this game itself is a very introductory game to you know his style of game, where you're going to be getting upgrades, building out things in front of you. But it's set in this really cool post-apocalyptic wasteland where people are harvesting water from the clouds. You are in command of this ship, and you're going to be going around this board, gaining resources by fighting in battles. And the way you do this is through this very simple deck. So you have this deck of cards in front of you, and you'll reveal two cards every turn. One's going to be your movement, one is your um, one is your movement, one is your energy value, and you're going to use those to move around and, you know, interact with the board. 
my favorite part of this game though has to be the at the end of the action phase you go into this secondary phase where you're able to either play upgrade cards and I love that or you can actually go and harvest the clouds and these sleeved cards here have clouds that actually obscure the resources that are available in the cards and if you're the one getting the resources not only do you get the card but you also pick a resource type that's obscured and choose that and get whatever resources underneath so I love this interesting form of push your luck and this guessing game that occurs and I love that all players are able to interact whenever anybody does this action so this does a great job of eliminating the downtime of the game where everybody's playing pretty much simultaneously for a lot of these actions fantastic style I really like this one that is cloud age my number five now my number four is Tidal Blades Heroes of the Reef. Now this game has you playing as a contestant to be the next Tidal Blade. You are trying to be a defender of the reef by going out and slaying monsters, but also impressing the judge, the old Tidal Blades, so that you can claim his place and really stand up above the rest. Now in gameplay terms, this translates to a dice manipulation, dice rolling game where you are going to be sending out worker placement spots, you're going to be putting characters on the board, uh, taking the action in the associated space, and then performing challenge cards. So these challenge cards are going to have you rolling a specific number of dice and your goal is to match symbols. And every time you match those symbols, you get to upgrade your character. Each character has lots of different traits. They have spirit and focus, synergy and uh, resilience. And these are going to allow you to do lots of different things in the game. Uh, my favorite part of this game, though, has to be the stunt cards themselves. So there's a stat on this dial, the stunt dial. And this is so neat because this dial is tied to cards. I'm actually going to talk about this in uh, our our corporate cardboard show with Dan from Chairman of the Board, but I love this mechanic that there's an entire section of the game that is powerful, but it gets more powerful the more you develop a specific stat. So it doesn't do anything on its own, but in conjunction with other things it can, where everything else works very seamlessly. I love this design. I love this artwork. This is one of the most pretty games I love. I love the aesthetic. This is one that you would really enjoy. If you like games like Champions of Midgard, where you're collecting dice and using them, this one is fantastic. It is so neat, so fun. I love the character customization. Great game. That's my number four, Tidal Blades. My number three goes to the game Rumble in the Dungeon, a very small party game, but a fantastic one. Rumble in the Dungeon is a bluffing game, but also kind of a manipulation game. In this one, you're going to be playing as two hidden characters, and these characters are going to be randomly assorted in a dungeon here. On your turn, you either move a character or you kill a character if there's one in the same room, but you can control any characters. You don't have to use your two. And that's super cool because the whole idea is you want to be positioning things on the board so that they're able to kill other things. That way your characters are protected. And it's so clever in the way it's done because the actions are so simple. But my favorite part of this game is the fact that when characters are in a room, they are stuck. It is a battle to the death. And that is so awesome because that allows for a lot of really interesting positioning as you play. A lot of clever, you know, counterplay, uh, predictions, bluffing. It is so neat. And the more you play this game, the more you realize, ah, I can do something like this, or maybe that person's doing that, or why is he moving that person that way? This is such a fun little game, and this Rumble in the Dungeon version includes a treasure chest kind of mini expansion that you can play with that adds a little bit of additional complexity, but more positioning and more creative movements that I think is really fun. This is a whole series of games, so you can use this theme if you like. There's a Cthulhu version, or there's just a generic Rumble in the House version. So whatever floats your boat, I think Rumble the Dungeon is a surefire winner. That's my number three. My number two goes to the game Heroes of Tenefer. Now, this game is so good. This is a cooperative deck building game where you play as classic fantasy races with your own unique player powers, but a starting deck that you'll customize as you play. Now, the game has you going from dungeon to dungeon. There are all these cards here that you'll be going through. You're going to pick a dungeon and go from each monster, but each monster you fight, when you play, you're only allowed one shot at this monster, and you're going to only get three cards to try to take out this monster. Now, when you do that, you'll reveal the top three cards of your deck, and hopefully that's a good combination. But have no fear, if you don't like the hand you got, you can dump your hand and draw three more. And you can keep doing that as much as you want until you got a hand that you like. But beware, the dungeon has four monsters, and your deck starts off pretty dang small. So if you run out of cards before the dungeon is over, you're no longer allowed to help in that dungeon. So, heck, if you start burning through cards, you may not be able to help when it really matters, and that can be really unfortunate. So sometimes this is kind of the, the pushing your luck mechanism, right? Really, really great mechanic here is, do you take a subpar hand so that you can guarantee that you can actually help? 
But if you do that, that might be not enough to actually take out this creature. And I love this mechanic. I think it's so good. That's my favorite part in this game is the mechanic. Now, another really cool part in this game is the monsters themselves. After you kill a monster, as you can see here, you turn the card over and they become cards in your deck. I think that's so amazing. And the thing on top of that is some of these monsters have bonus effects if specific characters have them. So it might be beneficial to strategize to say, hey, you kill this monster this time because it's so good for you. And some cards allow you to allow you to like switch cards in each other's deck. I think this game promotes healthy cooperation. The downtime is little because, you know, you, your deck is fast. You reveal three cards and you're going to be asking people. You're going to be asking for help, what you want to do. And ultimately, you are probably going to commit with maybe a hand or two. So not that many crazy decisions you'll be doing on your turn. I think that this is so well done. I love this cooperative aspect. I love the communication and the camaraderie that comes from the game. This is such a great system. That's my number two, Heroes of Tenefer. But my number one has to be Capital Lux 2 Generations now. This is one of the best filler games ever. I think it's absolutely wonderful. This is a game that takes area control, abstracts it into cards, and makes it interesting with unique power combinations. You have this really solid system that it's built on, but the modularity is huge. So in this game, you're going to be playing cards either in front of you to score points or in the center to trigger abilities. However, at the end of the round, if the cards in front of you are more than the cards in the center, you lose all those cards. So it's a mix between, ooh, I need to play these in front of me to score points, but if I put them out in the center, I can actually score more, but I'm allowing everybody else to score more too. But I get an effect if I put it in the center. So you have these tough decisions of, how and where do I play cards? But the decisions are short and snappy. The game plays so smooth and crisp. The variants and the effects are interesting and fun. This game is one that I keep on coming back to. It's one that I just want to introduce to everybody because I think it needs to get played. I really like this one. I think it needs way more love than it's getting. And this is one that should hit the table all the time. Now, my favorite part of this game is the card play. Now, at the start of each round, you're going to be drafting cards. You draw six, and you set up those dominoes to hopefully play during the round. After you get your six cards, I'll draft them two at a time, and then you'll play the round. On your turn, you either play in front of you, play to the center, and then at the end of the round, if you still have cards in your hand, you play them all in front of you. So it's a race against not only time and the other players, but maximizing your actions, maximizing your point yield, using those new abilities and the new combinations to the best of your ability. This is so succinct, so interesting, so fun. I love this game. This is Capital X2 Generations, my number one. And that is my list. Those are my top 10 underrated board games. What did you think? What are your top 10 underrated board games? Have you played any of these? Have you given them a try? Which ones do you agree with? Which one do you, do you disagree with? I'd love to hear what you think. But that's all for this list. Thank you so much for watching Side Game Strong.